a, a signed copy of the book that I'm going to be uh, uh, donating to uh, whoever the lucky winner is today. Uh, the hashtag that I do wish for you all to use, and please tweet away. I'm a big Twitter fan uh, today, the hashtag PR lessons. So any, uh, anything that, uh, any comments, uh, thoughts uh, that you would like uh, to uh, post about what we're going to be uh, going through here for the next uh, several minutes, please feel free to do that. I would also invite you, and I'll show this at the end of my presentation, but for those of you who are on Twitter and would like to uh, follow me, and I promise I'm going to follow right back, it is uh, simply at Mark Witt, that's M-A-R-C-W-H-I-T-T. And I would love to follow you and uh, on Twitter. And then I'm also on LinkedIn, but I'll give those, uh, that address to you uh, on down uh, into the presentation. So again, thank you all so much. Uh, we're gonna go through, we're gonna clip through several lessons uh, that, uh, that I have learned along my way. And I will even have a couple of confess, confession moments uh, here to you as students. Uh, uh, there, believe it or not, there is not a per perfect person around. Uh, and if anyone says that they are perfect, don't believe them. And I'm, I'm confessing right here that, uh, that uh, I had to learn the hard way on some of this. So when the book was being assembled, uh, I wanted to be very transparent. And, uh, and I'm going to share a couple of those uh, brief stories with you all, uh, just simply to, <laughs> to spare you any embarrassment uh, once you get into this field. So if we're ready to go, let's go ahead and get started. An elementary teacher once asked her class to define the word salt. Thinking a bit, the student responded, salt is what you don't notice unless it's missing. And you know, you think about it, but PR is truly much that same way, isn't it? Uh, we typically know when, uh, when PR is being effective, because why? The organization is being effective. It's reaching people. It's communicating effectively with people. Um, it's it's uh, helping thought leadership to determine uh, best practices, um, approaches, strategies are all formed. But when PR is not present, then we certainly know, and much like this definition here, uh, you could think about maybe uh, one of your favorite dishes that uh, your mom fixes, and when she maybe has forgotten that salt, you certainly notice when it is missing. I oftentimes think that uh, when people get, when they initially get into the field of public relations, they think that they uh, always uh, are the individual who is out front. But that's really not the case. Public relations is truly more about working behind the scenes than being on the stage. We're the ones who help those who are on the stage look better, sound better, communicate more effectively, and, uh, and are able to help uh, push the brand in a, in a much more effective and strategic way. So PR is truly more about the individual who's behind the scenes making these things happen than they are uh, being on the stage. One thing I want to make sure that each and every one of you know is that public relations is all about service. It's about serving others. In fact, if you had to spell public relations, I would say that you need to spell it S-E-R-V-I-C-E, -E, service. Public relations is truly of service. And our world is starved for those of you who are principle-centered, servant leaders. We need you to step up in a big and important way to become that leader. Another lesson that I think that is critical for us to realize is that this is not desk relations. It's what? It's public relations. So don't allow sitting behind a computer screen like, like we are today, and I'll go into that in just a bit. 
but don't allow sitting behind a computer screen keep you from meeting people face to face. Hone the skill of networking, then apply it to the profession's core mission of relationship building. Well, boy, this past March, who here thought that we would be uh, living a life like we are today? And who even thought of the word Zoom? It has taken such significance in our lives, hasn't it? And for those of us who are in public relations, it has placed so many more challenges in front of us. Recently, I read, um, I read a column in, I believe it was in PR News, that said that survey after survey is indicating that those who are in public relations work, as well as with the media, are working two to three times harder now since the pandemic for the most part, hit our lives back in February or March than ever before. And, but at the same time, it said that it was allowing us an incredible opportunity to show senior leadership the importance, the value of the work that we do. We have to think quickly. We have to prepare on, on a moment's notice. Um, there's a lot of shifting sands with this work. And so with us being in public relations, we have to be able to respond accordingly and quickly, effectively, showing our expertise all along the way. And as awful as this pandemic is, at the same time, it is allowing those of us who are in this field to be able to truly roll up our sleeves and give our total best, our 110% to the institution or organizations that, uh, that we represent. Now, when this was coming out in my book, we didn't know there was gonna be a pandemic. And the point that I was making with, uh, with this was that, that um, you know, I'm, I'm very much into, uh, into uh, tech, um, but, as well as I know you all are as well, if not more so. You, brought, you were brought up in that age um, where technology, internet, web, all the uh, smartphones, all, those, all the devices, communication devices have been so much a part of your life. These were not around when, uh, when I was there. In fact, uh, we had uh, to fend off uh, dinosaurs and cave, cavemen and women when I was, uh, when I was about your age. But in all seriousness, we have to be about relationship building. We have to be seeking opportunities that will allow us to network, to get to know people, to be able to sit with them. I'm a real big uh, fan of coffee shops. Uh, anybody there in the audience, give me, a, give me a, a big wave if you love a good coffee shop there in your area. Well, I do, and I find that being able to uh, now socially distance uh, with my coffee cup and, and being with colleagues and students and those who are in business or whatever walk of life, just to be able to share and get to know them is so critically important. And the danger that we can fall into and it's somewhat of a trap, to be honest with you, is to get so comfortable behind, sitting behind a computer screen that even though what we're doing today is quite effective, the best way to do our work is being able to do it face to face. So use the technology that we've been given and that we're appreciating today to find ways that uh, we can get to know each other even better through it. But boy, I cannot wait for the opportunity, I hope one day, where I can actually maybe meet some of you all face to face. We cannot uh, allow uh, the comfort of just sitting in a room by ourselves behind a computer screen to substitute what that face to face interaction can truly mean for us and in this work. Every person in your organization matters. Every person. As members of a symphony orchestra, we each have critical roles to play in our organization's success as we perform, perform in perfect harmony. 
Um, my dad was a uh, band director, so this probably doesn't come as a surprise when you see a comment like this. But uh, growing up, I believe Pam mentioned that I played trumpet. I've been playing trumpet since I was in third grade, so that's been a long time since I've had that horn in my hand. But then, so for, for those of you who perhaps are musicians, whether you play an instrument or maybe you sing in a choir, you'll always notice that the harmony, the richness comes out when more and more voices are added to it. And so that is much the same way in the work that we have. When each voice is added to our work, through the organization, it becomes even richer, fuller, even more important. And that is another aspect, another lesson in public relations that we need to be aware of. It's not just a few, but it's every person who does make a difference in our organization. Now, here's a story I've got to tell you all. Here's one of my confessions. I'll first let you know this lesson. People pay attention to influ influential curmudgeons. You're saying, what? <laughs> That's true. They may become your best supporters if you don't dismiss their opinion or overlook their input. All right, quick story, guys. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to work at a small private college in Kentucky. And they had never had any kind of PR or marketing plan ever. And so when I came on board, the uh, college president, who was quite eager for me to put one together, uh, gave me the charge to try to get this done within the first couple of months of my employment. So guess what I did? Oh boy, that was like putting raw steak in front of a bulldog. I was ready to go. So with all the gusto that I could, I spent about the next two weeks of doing nothing but getting this plan together. And when it was done, I'll have to tell you, I felt pretty darn proud of it. It looked just the way I was hoping that plan would come to. Furthermore, I took an opportunity, not at, well, after I had gotten the president's review and approval and blessing, I then took it to nearly and make sure you keep that word nearly highlighted here in your, in your mind. I went to nearly every department chair at this college to get their review and approval with the exception of one person. The one person that I failed to contact, to be honest with you, was quite intentional on my part. Why? Because he was known actually affectionately as Dr. Kermudgeon. He was tough to deal with. He had a personality that only a warthog would appreciate. He was tough. He was surly and, uh, and just was always point blank uh, with you. And by the time you were done with him, you typically didn't feel real great about yourself. So I did not want to have anything to do with him. Besides, why was that important? I'd already gotten the blessings of 99% of all the other department chairs as well as as well as the president of the college so the day came for me to meet with the faculty senate and uh, the plan was going to be voted on where i could then proceed with it and so the chair of the faculty senate got up and he asked everyone uh, there was a motion made on the floor he said all in favor please raise your please say aye well, everyone gives a big shout, I, any opposed? And all the way in the very back was one voice who yells, no. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, that was, even though it was one voice, it was a very important voice. The rule the faculty sent at this college had was that for any type of business that was presented in front of them, the vote, the approval had to be 100%, 100%. And so the one person that I had failed to reach out to was that one dissenting voice to my plan. I was destroyed, all that hard work for nothing. It was eventually decided to table it. And, uh, and so for about 24 hours after that meeting, I was kicking cans, thinking, you know, what, you know, what's the use? I've done all this work for nothing. 
and, and I, I was just feeling pretty bad about the whole situation. Next day, after a good night's sleep, I decided, you know, I'm going to run by uh, this gentleman's office, maybe see if he might have a cup of coffee with me. So I came in and I asked him, I said, uh, say, uh, would you have about uh, maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, if we could just sit down and talk about this? And he looked at me and very shortly said, nope, I can give you about five. And then I've got to move on. I've got a busy day. So I thought, okay, well, at least I've got five minutes. So we sat down for about five minutes and I asked him one important question. What do you think about this plan and how can it be improved? And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you that one simple question led from what was going to be a five minute meeting to a meeting that went an hour and a half an hour and a half and it all came down to the fact that this individual said that that and he recognized that his personality was not the best he also i mean it was very much different from what i was accustomed to it wasn't me but it was him and all he was seeking was somebody to hear him out so i won't bore you with all the other details that went along but the next month same business. Faculty Senate was getting ready to take a vote. Faculty Senate chair gets up, says, well, we had a motion from last month's meeting that, that was tabled. So all in favor, please say aye. And guess what happened? The person who had before given a dissenting vo voice to this stood up and shouted, let me bring comments to the floor. And he got up and told the faculty that Mark and I spent time a couple of weeks ago to go through this plan. I've reviewed it, gave him a couple of suggestions. I've reviewed it again. It looks great. And so I moved that, that we have formal adoption and it was 100%. So ladies and gentlemen, why do I take time to tell you that story? Whether you are, uh, no matter where you are in your stage of your career in PR, whether you're a student, maybe you're with a student organization there on your campus, or for those of us who teach or, um, or uh, perhaps work in some form of public relations uh, work, we're always going to meet individuals whose personalities are going to be different than ours, always. And it's a natural tendency for us to go to, toward those who are just like ourselves. But let me encourage you not to make the mistake that Mark made those many years ago when I intentionally left out a person who was not like me, didn't have the same kind of enthusiasm that, that I was seeking. But the bottom line was all he was seeking was to have his voice in something and he felt important after that. So he was an influential curmudgeon because people did listen to him. All right, so this other story never surprised the president. All right, this is another mistake, and I'm going to go quickly through this, but I had an internship when I was in college at the institution where uh, Dr. Pam Perry and I taught uh, and worked uh, several years ago. But when I was a student, when I was uh, actually a junior in college, I had an internship with the Department of Music. And the goal was that I had to, uh, I had to pack out a house for the big annual Christmas program, I had to, I was gonna get graded on this. I had to have about 1800 people in the seats out of a 2000 seat auditorium. And uh, my, uh, my uh, internship advisor wanted to uh, add a couple of other little goodies. He wanted to have the president and the first lady of the university there, as well as the governor and the first lady of the Commonwealth of Kentucky present. I was going to be graded on this and I had zero budget to be able to do this on. So trying to think the best way to do this, I actually was able, and I'm not going to go into detail how I did this part, but I was able to get uh, a copy of the letterhead from the president's office. And I wrote a letter on behalf of the president, thinking that this was perfectly fine to the governor of Kentucky. Well, about three weeks, four weeks after I had sent that letter, and I had had a full day of classes. I got back to my room 
only for my roommate to be shocked. And he said, Mark, what are you doing here? The president's office just called and Dr. Powell wants to see you there immediately. Well, I ran to his office. He didn't know me from Adam. And I thought for sure that was probably going to be my last day as a college student there. Well, as I got in there, lo and behold, he, after sitting there quietly in his office for what seemed like an eternity, he eventually told me that the governor and the first lady had accepted his invitation, one of which he never knew that he had, he had sent. He asked me in so many ways <laughs> what my plans were when I graduated from college, and I told him that I wanted to go into higher ed PR work. And he looked up at me and he said, let this old president give you a word of advice, son. Never surprise the president. Well, great lesson learned there. I will say I got an A on my internship, but still the lesson is that you never do want to surprise your immediate supervisor. You always need to make sure that those uh, in front of you and around you clearly understand where you're going and that you can't be uh, the, uh, the Lone Ranger out here in the work that you do. All right, so we're going to clip through some of these uh, a little bit quicker, but those were two personal goofs that Mark made along the way that I wanted to protect you about. Regardless of your title or position, lead from where you are. I don't care what you do. I don't care what role you play, but if you are attached in some way to, uh, to an organization, regardless of your title or position, lead from where you are. Another lesson, no matter how old you are or how long you've been in a communication related field, maintain the fire in your belly. Doing so will give you the edge you need to create and perform at your finest. I'm not sure how many of you have ever heard the phrase fire in your belly, but in short, it's that intensity that you feel that that intensity, that excitement, that enthusiasm, that you want to give it your very, very best. And you've got to hold on to that. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on to that throughout your career. Uh, I know that right now, as many of you are looking uh, toward graduation date, and you're excited about that, can't wait to go. That's the kind of fire in your belly that, that begins happening. But as you go along in life, don't let that, that fire begin to dwindle. Right now, this maybe doesn't mean a whole lot to you, but I want you to remember this, that as you grow in this profession, as long as you can keep that fire in your belly, that intensity, that excitement, enthusiasm about the work that you're going to do, I can just about guarantee you that you're going to be performing at your finest. Okay, young professional. Let's see a show of hands, those of you who are young professionals. Well, that's just about 90% of you. Give me a wave there. All right, young professional, cherish the wealth of knowledge and wisdom senior professionals bring and learn from them. If there's a person who has been in this work for a while, your professors, uh, those who uh, perhaps are with an agency or those who are with a nonprofit organization, find somebody who has been in this work a while and just listen to them, learn from them, watch them. But at the same time, senior professional, those such as myself, cherish the wealth of energy and new ideas young professionals bring and learn from them. Uh, before we began uh, today, uh, uh, Dr. Perry and I were talking about that, uh, that we tend to learn so much more from those of you who are students and perhaps you all learn from us because you bring such energy and new ideas uh, to the work. And um, uh, as it was mentioned, I teach uh, PR classes at uh, the University of Kentucky as well. And I know that every semester I learn so much more from my students and it enables me to be even more effective as a senior professional. Important guys, start strong, finish stronger. So many times when we begin, uh, whether it's a campaign or we're helping to uh, uh, to launch a movement of some type or whatever type of effort we're doing in PR. We always have that excitement and we start out so strong. But after we've had to do research and we go through long, long tedious hours of polishing it and evaluating it, executing it, 
reevaluating it, on and on and on. Oftentimes what happens is that fire begins to dwindle just a bit. But the true professional in this work is going to push themselves even harder toward the finish line. So let me encourage you to be that kind of professional. I know you can start strong, but the true professional in this work is going to be the one who finishes even stronger. And I know that you can do that. Here's another good one. Don't dismiss the importance of first impressions. Always come prepared. When you come to a meeting and you know that you're going to be a part of uh, discussions, make sure you've done your homework in advance that you know what, you, what you're going to be talking about. When you walk into the room, understand the dynamics, the uh, nonverbal communication that is going on. Know how you come across. Be very sensitive to how you present yourself, both physically, and again, there are those nonverbal cues. It's so, so important. In our profession, continually think about the next step, that next opportunity. Nothing should be seen as one and done in our work. There should always be that next opportunity, that next step that you need to take whenever you're, you're um, uh, creating an idea, getting ready to launch that idea or that initiative. Always be thinking about the back of your mind. Where can this idea, this initiative lead? What's the next place to go to? In, in, in <laughs> sorry about that, in planning, I'll get my tongue straight here, in planning communication strategies, it's vital we always seek ways to build relationships. Guys, no matter what you do in this work, it's about building relationships. And so in all of the strategies that you develop, you always need to be thinking about how can they build even better relationships, whether they be new or you're building on those that have existed for a while. Become skilled at managing a crisis. It's one of the best ways to sharpen your skills as a public relations professional. Why do I say that? Well, several years ago, uh, I had an opportunity at an institution where, uh, where Dr. Perry and I were serving, where we had a mercury spill. And Pam, you may remember that, I'm not sure. But we had a mercury spill. And uh, we were moving from the old chemistry building across campus to a brand new uh, science facility. Unfortunately, those who were doing the moving did not realize that a canister of mercury was slowly leaking and leaked all the way down through the campus streets, all the way up to the new building, up into the lab. It was, oh, it was, it was a real mess in more ways than one. And immediately uh, the uh, 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 Environmental Protection Agency came in and, and uh, defined it as the, as the worst mercury spill in the Southeast US. And, uh, and that was nothing to be proud about. There are times where you wanna be proud to be number one. This was not one of those times. I knew nothing about mercury other than when I was a kid, and, by, and please don't do this, but we didn't know better back then where you'd take a little bit piece of mercury and put it maybe on a, on a dime and shine it, up, shine it up. Well, as we all know now, mercury is nothing, nothing to be played with, but I had to become an instant expert on mercury and how to safely dispose of it. Why? Because I had state, regional, and national media outlets that were flying in from everywhere for, for that interview. Well, when we learn as professionals to be able to manage a crisis and to become instant experts, it truly sharpens our skills. And then in connection with that, when you are going through, a, uh, through any kind of crisis, keep calm and communicate on. Those around you will respond and mirror your behavior during times of crisis and challenge. Think about it for a second. When uh, somebody uh, kind of takes on the chicken little 
mantle and just begins flying off and flying around and going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, everything is wrong, is wrong. And invariably, people around them will take on that same type of, uh, of attitude, that same type of behavior. But for those of us who are in public relations, you have to automatically gear yourself down, speak slowly, speak calmly, and to be able to, to show confidence. I mean, you may be sweating like Niagara Falls on the inside, but on the outside, you've got to be as cool as a cucumber and to be able to communicate uh, as effectively as possible. So always be mindful that whenever you're going through a crisis situation, to, to keep yourself calm and speak slowly. This is so important for those of us who are in public relations. Whenever those crises do happen, we have to be out in the front uh, speaking with media. Never give bad news more life than it deserves. Address it head on with full transparency, honesty, and timeliness. Uh, unfortunately, when um, there, there are so many examples, I know that you all discuss this uh, in your classes there, uh, that, uh, that oftentimes people will panic. Oh my gosh, we've got bad news. Uh, let's don't tell the whole story. Let's just tell a little bit. And I'll tell you, invariably what happens is you've just given even greater life to that story. So in order to, to cut it off, not to give it more life than it deserves, hit it head on, address the issues, be fully transparent, and your honesty and timeliness will truly pay off. Now we're guilty about this next one, especially for those of us in higher education. We love our acronyms. We're, uh, for example, uh, I hold membership in organizations such as CASE, uh, PRCA, and several others. Well, for those of us who may be in the communications field, we know maybe what those organizations stand for. But to those who are outside of that field, they have absolutely no idea uh, what, what those organizations mean, unless we truly spell them out. So when communicating with the public, try your best to stay away from using jargons or acronyms. Your audience may or may not understand them. I encourage you to speak or write the language of the people because after all, that's what we truly seek to do in our work, to communicate. And this I find is really important. The bottom line is that as a public relations professional, you want to make yourself indispensable. If I think so many of us have the dream that we want to be able to be in a position where we take our skills and abilities and our know-how and the counsel that we can provide in public relations work and to be able to share that with, uh, with the senior leadership of our organization or institutions in order to make wise decisions and choices. And that's why it's important that your voice be a part of that. And so make yourself indispensable. Make yourself the person that others, others on that leadership team are looking to for that wise counsel. So as you all are beginning to get ready to uh, go into employment, there's a whole lot in front of you and you're eager, you're excited, can't wait to get, uh, get started. I certainly understand. I remember those days. But once you land your first public relations position, here's what I would suggest you first do. Take time and become a sponge. Allow yourself to be absorbed by your organization's culture, traditions, and values, then respect and honor them. And when I'm saying to be a sponge, obviously what I'm talking about is to absorb everything, to be just like that sponge. Take time to also be engaged uh, into the life of your organization. When, when others see that, that you are taking your time, that you want to be involved, and, uh, and they can see uh, from their own uh, eyes that, uh, that you're very much interested, excited, enthused, and involved in your organization. That's all a part of it. But it's also important, guys, to do what? To listen. To listen. 
a lot of times we think that in public relations, most of what we do is all about talking. But I would argue that it needs to be just the opposite. We need to be more effective than we ever are in listening. We need to develop those listening skills because when we truly listen five times more than we talk, I think we'll all be amazed by what we learn from that. And, and as a result, we can become even more effective communicators. So how many of you think that you have to be the person who has to come up with all the great ideas, particularly if they're related to PR? Is there a show of hands? Well, I'm going to show my hand because I fell into thinking this when I graduated from college because it was kind of brought up to me that, uh, that you know, you're going to be in PR and people are going to be looking to you to always be coming up with the ideas. True, you need to come and be prepared with ideas, but don't put the extra pressure on yourself to think that you always have to be the one and the only individual that comes up with the best ideas or answers in that room. But come prepared uh, to be able to have dialogue, to offer suggestions and advice. And here's a good one, because I've heard this many times. Well, we've done that before. It never worked then. Why try it again? I challenge you all that whenever you hear that, think about, and if it's a worthy consideration, don't do it just because people said we tried it and, and it never worked, and maybe there was a reason for that. But if you see that there is an idea that maybe is worth revisiting, think about how it could be retooled and, and how it could be an incredible success for your organization. And I'm going to push on here to a, to a few more because I know we're going to be running out of time here for a lot of things. Never burn a bridge. Never, ever. Now, right now, that may not mean a whole lot to you all because you haven't started in, into your professional careers yet. But we all know that during, the, uh, during those years that uh, from college graduation all the way up to retirement, we will change jobs. Um, some have given estimates uh, of 10 times. Some have said as many as 20 times. I don't know. It just depends. But, never, but nevertheless, you never, ever want to leave a, uh, a place by destroying it and destroying those that you worked with. Number one, it's just not a right thing to do. But number two, it makes you look pretty small. So you always want to keep very positive, move on, and keep those bridges working for you. Because I guarantee you, down the road, you'll be glad you did. Uh, <laughs> here's one I think that we all need to be aware of. People expect excellent service. Be exceptional, and you'll be remembered and invited back. Now, I'll have to say that, uh, uh, you know, let me ask you this. For those of you who uh, uh, maybe you're wanting a hamburger for dinner tonight, you and maybe a couple of your friends, and you're going down the bypass, and uh, how many times will you say, hey, let's go over here to uh, the Burger Shack. I hear that they've got a real fair hamburger. It's really not tasty, but let's pull in. Well, that sounds pretty ridiculous, doesn't it? Because why? We automatically expect excellence. No matter what service, what product we take, we expect excellent, excellent service, excellent quality, whatever. But I guarantee you that if you go above and beyond the call of duty and give it just that much more by being exceptional, you will be remembered and people will begin talking about you. Word of mouth will spread. They'll mention, boy, I worked with so-and-so. They offered some great public relations counsel. And you know what? Not only did they achieve what I wanted to do, but they did X, Y, Z extra for me. And because of that, that will spread. And those people will invite you back because you were exceptional. Meet each day with high expectations. Seek to make a measured difference for your organization and its supporters. So when you begin the day, think about how you can make 
a major, a major or even a minor difference for your organization. Your life, your contributions can mean the world to, to those not only around you, but to your organization overall. And then I'm going to, I, I've got two or three more here I want to share with you before we close and see if there are any questions. Oftentimes, guys, we have this feeling that, uh, that if we ask for help, it's a, it's a sign of weakness. But instead, asking for help is a sign of strength and plain old smarts. So you need to be uh, mindful that not, none of us have all the answers and it is perfectly fine to ask questions. It's far better to ask a question knowing that at least you have the answer rather than not asking and then a bad mistake happens. So don't see it as a weakness, see it as a sign of strength. And then maintain a good sense of humor. It will always see you through life's up and downs. I can guarantee you this. And uh, for those of us who have been around for a while, let me tell you, if you don't maintain a good sense of humor, it takes away your flexibility to be able to work in this, in this profession or in any aspect of life uh, for that matter. So maintain a good sense of humor. All right, well, our time is getting a little, little thin here. So I'm going to run on up here and I think this is being uh, recorded and, uh, and we'll make sure to, to be able to get these, uh, these to you. But this is important guys, details matter. In our work, it's very easy to see to the big things. But going back to being exceptional, when we see to details, those small matters, it will totally make a difference uh, in the execution of whatever effort you're giving uh, in public relations work. And then grab the low-hanging fruit before seeking the apple at the top of the tree. Great PR and marketing opportunities are often, often dangling in front of us. Don't overlook them. This brings back memories of, of my grandparents had a big apple tree in their backyard. And one summer, there was this beautiful red apple that was perched right on top of the tree. I mean, it was probably about 30 feet up. And I was just a little boy at the time. And I was just bound and determined to have to climb that tree to pick that apple. And, uh, and so I did climb the tree. I nearly fell uh, out of that tree. But guess what? Guess what I was missing? There were countless apples that were just as large as that one that was sitting way up on that tree that were hitting me right in the face. They were within reach of me. And so it's, it's really important that in our work in PR, there's nothing wrong with seeing that ultimate goal, which may be all the way up on top of that tree, but for whatever PR and marketing opportunities are dangling right in front of your face, make sure you go after them first and it will make a difference. Lead by example. Integrity and character come first. After all, guys, your name is all you really own and control. So no matter what you do, integrity has got to come first in your work. Always remember to say thank you. Be grateful. It's the right thing to do, and besides, your mom will be proud of you. As simple as saying thank you, why on earth do we fail at doing this? If someone has done something for you, take the time to scribble out a note, to send an email, to pick up a phone, to call and say, thank you. It will make such a huge difference in the lives of others. Besides, it'll make you feel pretty good too when you get the reaction from these individuals. Don't forget to say thank you and to be grateful along the way. And here's an important one. Drink coffee, plenty of it. I probably drink too much of it, but it will help you through the day. <laughs> but guys, in all seriousness, our world has been waiting for your contribution. 
So I encourage you to seize this moment. I can't wait to hear about reports about what you are doing. And who knows, maybe our paths will cross and, uh, and we'll, we can relive having this time together. But we're waiting for you. You all are going to be one of the most important generations to come out of our communication departments and colleges. You're well-trained. You're, you're prepared to meet the demands uh, of, of our world today and in the future. I just challenge you to seize this moment, to take this responsibility, because I can't wait. You're going to make a difference for us. And with all the work that, that you will come along the way, I think one of the most important things is don't forget to have fun. Enjoy this journey. I've been doing this work now for 35 years, as it was mentioned. It just seems like yesterday I was your age getting ready to go out, and here I am, uh, kind of an old geezer <laughs> in this work. But looking back, it has been a great journey. And I'm not done yet. Still have several more years that I'm put, planning to put in. But enjoy the journey and, uh, and have fun with it. So with that said, uh, Pam, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I don't know. There may be some uh, who would uh, maybe like to ask you uh, questions that you can convey back to me, however you want to handle. Okay. Um, you have a little time. Anybody have a question? I wasn't, I was telling you the truth, right? Uh, right, right before the session, I was trying out the equipment and Jim Dubik was in here to, to help me make sure everything was working. And he, he said to Mark, he said, she sure been talking you up. And um, I know I was talking about, uh, thank you, Mark. Let's give him a round of applause. Thanks guys. It's been great being with you. I would much rather have been uh, there with you, uh, but this is the best we can do for now. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. It has been just so fun to see you. It's been a long time and, and I'll be in touch. Sounds great. And guys, my very best to each of you here again. If you would like to uh, connect with me on Twitter at Mark with, uh, 